global uh, banking crisis and the banks were broke. Mm -hmm. If you didn't intervene, the system would have broken down right then because every bank would have been, would have been uh, uh, bankrupt. But the, the, the central banks got together and the IMF lent money to, the, to uh, Chile and, and, and Brazil. I, I, visited, <laughs> I visited Chile in 1982 to look at the mountain, uh, mountains, the mountains of debt. I went to And so the central banks lent enough money and forced the banks to lend money to Chile and to Brazil so that they could pay the interest. Mm -hmm. And then they allowed the banks free hand to make as much money as possible, very steep yield curve, very good earnings. And now after five years or so of great misery in Latin America, the banks got fat and you could actually restructure the bonds and introduce Brady bonds. And you got out of the crisis. So had you not done that, the system wouldn't be there today. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm saying that the gentleman is on the wrong track. One of, the things, one of the things that I think we can be fairly clear of is that a response to this current crisis will lead to greater regulation. One question I have for you is, do you think that uh, in generally, both in the United States and globally, it will lead to uh, over-regulation and overshoot what we need to do? Do you think that there will be too much hesitancy and we will undershoot the level of regulation that you need? And what do you think the consequences will be of either overshooting or undershooting in your opinion? Well, I think if history is any guide, you then go back to, to regulation. Um, and I think it would be a very unfortunate outcome because one has to, you know, I argue that the, this, this ideology which says that markets are perfect is wrong. But one has to recognize that uh, uh, regulations are also uh, wrong, you know, imperfect. And in fact, they are more imperfect than markets because regulators are not only human, but they are also bureaucratic and they are also subject to political influences. So wherever possible, you want to use the market mechanism. In other words, you, 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 you don't want to regulate more than you have to. However, I think you must regulate credit as well as money. And that does require more regulation. Uh, and hopefully, we will avoid over-regulation. But undoubtedly, uh, um, financial business will not be as profitable as it has been in the last uh, 25 years. The financial institutions won't represent 25% of the market capitalization of the, of the stock exchange and won't represent, I think, they were 40% uh, of the corporate earnings mm -hmm. were financial earnings. That, that was an excess and th that we will not come back to. And regulation will certainly make, uh, 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 make business unprofitable and certain business models that rely on excessive leverage uh, like, for instance, long-term capital management, sure. will prove to be un unworkable. But the, the, the risk is that all that may move to the periphery or to the shadow financial market. No? You regulate the, the regulated system and, and then you get very high leverage in you know, hedge funds and, and places you can regulate very well. Uh, no, I don't think so, uh, because, because the, you, reg you regulate hedge funds through the the banks that the banks you, uh, because the banks uh, have to have risk adjustment uh, and this, the amount of leverage in hedge funds ought to be taken to account. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Mr. Soros. Um, I'm not going to ask you to predict the future, but I, I do, I, I pointed, um, I noticed three contradictions, apparent contradictions in uh, what you said here, and just, maybe you can address them. Uh, you said the world's going to become less uh, U.S. centric, but uh, at the same time, you also say countries like Russia and the Middle East will have a lot less power because of the declining price of oil. 
So how does that work? Because that's what, you know, the U.S.'s greatest enemies. Um, Maybe, you, you, let, let me answer sure. one by one, because, sure. uh, you know, my memory doesn't... Uh, 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 then, then just address two of them, not three. Uh, 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 the U.S. will cease to be the the undisputed dominant force that can impose its will on the world. For instance, hopefully China will move towards a more democratic form of government and will be part of the world system. will have to have a, great, a lot more weight than it currently has. The, 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 the veto power that we have in the IMF has to disappear. So we'll be downsized. But at the same time, hopefully, uh, we will have uh, um, a better working system and the, the opponents uh, will be more downsized than we will be. Thank you for that. Uh, next point would be, uh, isn't this uh, one of several books that you've written about the end of, uh, you know, um, yes. capitalism or whatever uh, yes. current uh, yes. thing? Yeah, I've, I've cried wolf three times. First in 1987, <laughs> then, in, then in 1997, and now. And the third time the wolf came. And, <laughs> and basically, basically I, was, I was commenting on the same super bubble and the error of market fundamentalism. And honestly, I, I, did, I didn't think that we would get out of the 97-98 uh, crisis. And it was only by uh, these uh, excesses in, in uh, making money available, et cetera, that we got out of it. Uh, so, and, and also, people like me, who saw the bubble, or the housing bubble, expected it to burst much sooner. I mean, in 2006. And the real damage was done in the last two years. If it had burst in 2006 instead of 2007, probably we would not be the, at the end of the super bubble well, because the, the system would have survived. It, Do you think you can manually burst the bubble? Okay. Do you think central banks let's, let's move on. Okay. Next question. Hi, Mr. Soros. Um, so you have a proven track record of being not only a financier, but also, you know, um, a philanthropist and a political activist. But on the other hand, uh, many of the actions you've done in the past have been a bit controversial. So uh, take, for example, back in 1992, um, you know, Black Wednesday, um, your quantum fund had a $10 billion bet against the British pound. And uh, profits from that transaction amounted to about $1 billion. But afterwards, you know, it threw the British economy into chaos. You know, housing prices, interest rates, whatnot. And similarly, back in 1997, um, during the Asian, you know, financial crisis, Thai nationalists depicted you as a sort of a economic war criminal. Um, my yeah. question is, um, given I, my understanding is that you no longer work, um, you no longer do trades, you're more focused on sort of your political activi uh, activism and um, <clears throat> philanthropy, but during your time as a hedge fund manager, how did you balance um, between, you know, your role as a hedge fund manager versus any drastic implications that uh, your trades, your speculation could have on, on the economy and foreign economies? Yeah. Very, very simply and, and, and uh, 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 very clearly, uh, I played by the rules. Uh, I was the market. I was a member of the market. I was doing what other people in the market were doing, and it was all according to the rules. And as, therefore, whatever I did, has absolutely no negative moral uh, implications. Uh, um, at the same time, as a citizen, uh, I was concerned with making the rules better. So, uh, and I, I'm still concerned. And I think one has to uh, distinguish between the two things. 
being a, a, a participant, you 